seeing so many of you tonight. We appreciate you coming out. Our, uh, I'm Pat Miner, and I'm from Iowans for Palestine. We thank our co-sponsors, who include Veterans for Peace, um, Peace Iowa, uh, uh, the Uni University of Iowa Committee for Human Rights, and is Center for Human Rights. And is there anybody else? I think that's it. Oh yeah, concerned Iowans for Middle East peace. Thank you. So, so we thank all of our co-sponsors tonight, um, and I am going to introduce. Most of you already know him, so I haven't been. There's not too much I'll introduce, but I'm going to introduce Newman Abuisa. He's been working for the Iowa Department of Transportation for 30 years. He's worked bridge and road design, materials, maintenance, and project management and construction. And he's a member of the advisory board for the UI Center for Human Rights. See, it was right there if I just read it. <laughs> he's chair of the board for Peace Iowa. He, he's treasurer for Civic, the Council of International Visitors to Iowa Cities, and the parish council for chair for St. Raphael Orthodox Church. He's married to his wife, Christy, and they have three grown sons and a daughter who's a junior at City High. Will you join me in welcoming Newman Abu? It's my pleasure and honor to, uh, to be with you today and to introduce uh, Amira. Before I introduce Amira, I just want to mention that we have a table of literature here. It has uh, literature from uh, uh, Peace Iowa, Veterans for Peace, and also I have uh, I am on the state uh, uh, platform committee. I was the chair of the International Affairs Subcommittee. And we worked really hard to represent Iowa's views, especially on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we have a brochure. Pat and I put together just the summary of what we've done on, on the platform. Two of the planks, but there's about four more planks. And I would encourage you to, to uh, get a piece, uh, a sheet of, uh, of the platform, which has uh, Pat's contact information and my contact information. And, uh, and uh, access also the platform online. Because it's important, I think, to make that uh, platform uh, 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 known to our visitors. Who, uh, we have many presidential candidates visitors to Iowa. And it's really our responsibility to let them know what Iowa think. And if they agree with Iowans. This is not your pla uh, platform or my platform. It's the whole state of Iowa uh, Democratic Party, if you happen to be Democrats. If you are Republican also, you can look at the Republican platform and make that known to them as well. Uh, <laughs> Before I, I introduce Amira, I just want to announce that I'll be running for uh, the congressional seat uh, in Iowa to, uh, after uh, Dave Lobsack. So if you are interested <laughs> if you are interested in helping me, we will be that I'm going to try to have a meeting uh, this uh, Saturday exploratory and, and try to prepare. And uh, hopefully I'll be announcing in a couple more weeks, two to four weeks, basically, uh, late, late May or early, early June. So with that, I'll, uh, I guess I have also asked, uh, I guess, uh, Munir is going to have a forum uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, Israeli, uh, dialogue yes. on Wednesday at 6.30 at the Merge. And he is uh, having a, the, the conversation or a debate? Well, we're having, on Wednesday, we're having a conversation. We're hoping it will be a civil and um, dialogue between myself and my friend David Weltman. He is the, uh, the uh, executive director of the Halal House. And we'd love to see you there. It's going to be at 6.30 at Merge, which is attached to this building. You just walk on the Fed Mall. It will be at um, on the west side of this building. And if you come early, there might be some hummus and falafel. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm st I need to speak here. Okay. And I also have this form Newman, for. Uh... Yeah, please sign up on the. Uh, uh, be uh, one of our members for Concerned Ions for Middle East Peace. Would love to have you connect with us as well. I'll pass this around. Would love to have your phone number and email so we can put you know what events. Um, I know some of you have have filled this out before, but feel free to pass this around. Uh, Newman, can I make one quick announcement? Quick. Um, yes. On uh, June 2nd, at the Cedar Rapids Library, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we're doing an event on the Liberty Ship. So everybody's in public. Can't hear. Uh, on on June, 2nd, June 2nd, the U.S. Liberty Ship uh, uh, survival, so one of the Liberty Ship survivors. Three of them. 
uh, from Iowa, from, from Clinton, in addition to two others who are coming from out of state, will be in Cedar Rapids. And if you are interested in this event, please uh, talk to uh, Joe after this event. With that, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our special guest today. I'm very happy and privileged to be an Arab introducing an Israeli. It's really a, a, a gesture for us uh, that uh, we've just had uh, lunch together and, and we, we, we talk together and we can work together and we can live together. I come from Damascus, uh, from, we, I lived in Damascus in, in the Christian sector which is very close to the Jewish sector. And uh, my grocery store owner was, was Jewish and we've got along uh, uh, over hundreds of years and we can get along unlike what the media and others might uh, portray. It's not, not uh, accurate that uh, we can live together and we can work together. We don't uh, like the extremists on both sides for that matter, but there's many, many, many uh, people who are uh, uh, moderate who can work together. Uh, Amira Haas brings a fresh and much needed uh, insight to the past, uh, present, and future of the Palestinian-Israeli relations. She draws on 30 years of experience as an Israeli journalist and analyst who has sought and achieved unparalleled immersions in Palestinian com communities in the West Bank and Gaza. She's born in Jerusalem and joined the Israeli daily newspaper Haaretz, which is a very old paper. It was uh, established in the early 1900. She joined in uh, 1989 and has been its correspondent in the occupied Palest Palestinian territories since 1993. She has lived in the West Bank city of Ramallah since 1997. <coughs> Ramallah uh, chronicles a compilation of the articles between 1997 and 2003 was published in 2005. Before taking up resist, uh, residence in the West Bank, Haas lived in, in Gaza for three years, which, uh, which experience uh, serve, served as a basis of her widely acclaimed book, Drinking the Sea of Gaza. Haas is the only child of a Sarajevo-born Jewish mother who survived nine months in the Bergen-Belsen uh, concentration camp and a Romanian-born Jewish father who survived three wartime years in, the, in a ghetto. Please help me welcoming Amira Haas. Thank you, thank you, good evening, and thank you for coming here uh, to listen uh, to listen to unpleasant facts. <laughs> um, I was asked to um, to talk mainly or to to, cons to 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 dedicate my my talk, not the Q and A, my talk on the uh, new Israeli basic law. Uh, nation state law. It is very specific, so it is very, um, you know, everything to do with, with, with laws and uh, legalistic approaches or analysis is very specific. And I must thank you for this because I, I'll share with you a secret, because so many people wrote about it and so many journalists uh, worked on this, I felt kind of exempt of, of, of of going deep into this, into the law. Uh, I have so many other things to deal with when I cover the, the, the Israeli policies against Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. But this request that I dedicate a great part of the talk to this law made me sit and read a little bit more than I would have, and I thank you for this. Um, and I'll try, because as I said, because it is so specific, and I want to go beyond just the, 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 uh, the headlines, exactly. Uh, so I'll need your, if you really, something is really not understood, please ask me. And I'll need your cooperation in, in, in some silence to those, some of those details. Of course, I will not bring all. So the headline would be that here we have a law that subjugates the democratic essence or identity and democratic obligation of the uh, state of Israel to its Jewish character. And Jewish, I mean not only as Jewish as religious, but ethnic. 
so it is the Jure uh, pri uh, giving the Jure priority to anybody who is Jewish, either uh, Israeli citizen or Jewish uh, all over the world, uh, over the Palestinian, Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel. Because there are around 20% of the Palestinians in Israel, uh, uh, the, uh, the citizens in Israel are Palestinian. This law doesn't include two basic words that have been used in former laws and also basic laws. laws. Two basic terms, democracy and equality. It omits them and not, uh, not by accident. Now, some of, some of you who might know the situation a bit more will ask, so what's new about it? And that's exactly what, what we felt when we read, we people who are not uh, in legal, not, not very uh, uh, savvy in legal, legal terminologies and uh, legal analysis, what's new about it? Because de facto, this is, this is how I can describe Israel. Israel in its Israeli state, not, not including the, occupied, the territory that was occupied in 1967, which is the West Bank and Gaza, but the pre-1967 uh, borders Israel. So it is a state that behaved like a state where Jews have, uh, superior, uh, have superiority and have privileges, not rights, because privileges is when a right is just given to, to a certain group and not to another, at the expense that the Jews have privileges at the expense of Palestinians, and there is no equality. So it was a de facto situation, even though there were, uh, the, 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 there were laws that called for democracy, or the, I mean, that place democracy as a, the essence of, or the basis of the state, and the, 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 the uh, principle and value of, of equality was seen as self-evident uh, within the structure of the state. Um, but what I understood from, uh, already before coming here, but what I understood from friends and from, from experts and from people who protested the, the law, that beside actually uh, uh, cementing a de facto situation, cementing it in law, it also blocks all former attempts to amend the reality, to amend this uh, faults in Israeli system. So there were quite a few over the years. There were, uh, there was first of all, the Palestinian, the struggle of Palestinian citizens for rights, for more budget allocations, for more equality in housing, in opportunities to study and to work. There were such struggles. There have been and still today there are. And the legal system or the judiciary, the, 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 the courts were in favor of those struggles. Grosso modo, you know, in, 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 in general, you, we could see that there were several rulings of courts that were based on this principle of equality. And when uh, Palestinians, citizens of Israel, f went to court, filed petitions against discrimination, the, law, the, the courts relied on the principle of equality while it accepted, it ruled in favor of those petitions. Now, with the law, as I'll show you in a second, with this law, actually, courts get a green light to, to reject future petitions. Because if the law if there is a law that, that, that discriminates against Palestinians with so many words, then who are we, the judges, to rule differently? Um, I would mention only three of the, of the, of the, of the clauses of this law that, that um, 
as I say, cement the, 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 the discrimination in law, in legal terms. The, um, or for, the um, self-determination, the right for self-determination is in, within the borders of the state are only to Jews, is uh, 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 only Jews have this right for self-determination. Now, the state expresses the right of Jews for self-determination by its very existence as a state for Jews, a democracy which is also for, but by saying that only Jews have this, self this right for self-determination within the state, it actually does not acknowledge the collective rights of the Palestinian minority in the state. Now we know in history or in the, in the, practi in the practices of, of, of uh, or in the evolvement of this term and the right of self-determination, that it doesn't have always to be expressed in a state. It can be expressed in, uh, in cultural rights, in autonom autonomy rights, in, in, in many different ways, not necessarily in secession or, or a, of a group leaving the state and establishing as a, a, a state in a certain territory. But it means that it is a collective. The recognition of this group as a collective. And a collective that has rights to, uh, uh, rights as a collective. And this law actually undermines this, uh, this right. The law also lowered the status or uh, downgraded the, state, the status of Arabic as an official language. Arabic is the natural uh, 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 language of a people that lives in this country for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And that was, was spoken in this country uh, since a little bit probably after Jesus because he spoke in uh, Aramaic. But <laughs> that has developed over thousands of years this language, like the Hebrew. But the Hebrew was spoken by less people over time, and the Arabic was a main language. To such an extent, the Jews who used to live in this country in the 17th and 16th and uh, 19th century, uh, those who came, who, who lived there uh, for many centuries before, they also spoke Arabic. Also, Arabic was their uh, mother tongue. So by downgrading the level, the, 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 the level of Arabic as an official language to a language with a special status, that's how it says the law, you actually obliterate the connection of these people to the land. You don't really obliterate, because Palestinians all feel the connection. They don't need Israeli approval for them to be connected and to know that they are connected and to know that their language has been the language of the place since, uh, uh, since so many centuries. But it puts them in a, in a, in a first it is a, a, a humiliating act, um, condescending that rather condescending act. And it puts them, of course, in an in, in inferior, inferior position when it comes to studies, to universities, to development of, or to encouragement of, uh, of literature, or encouragement of schools. So it has a variety of ways that, that because it is not official, that it will be uh, uh, even further uh, sidelined. Um, another, another, um, another point is uh, encouragement of Jewish settlement inside inside Israel proper. I'm not talking about uh, about the 67 occupied territory. Now, what has Israel done if not encouraging Jewish and 
and exclusive Jewish uh, communities and settling over the years. Uh, it has done so since day one, since 1948, uh, to, a, to an extent that, that, um, that Palestinians who are Israeli citizens were deprived of most of their land and uh, congested into their original uh, villages that became slums. Villages that had space, that had room, that had uh, 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 lands, are now have become townships. Where because Palestinians don't, because most of the land was taken for the sake of Jewish settlement. Uh, together with all sorts of laws that, or all, all sorts of uh, um, planning, planning, uh, other planning. Um, uh, decrees that took land for military reasons or security reasons and uh, public reasons, etc. So there is nothing new to it that Jewish settlement was encouraged and not Palestinian. They are, um, but as I said, there were some fi some petitions filed to High Court over the years, which challenged these discriminatory policies and whereby the Israeli judges of high court had to accept that Israeli policies are discriminatory. And now it's gone. Now it is, uh, with this law, Israel will have even more ha free hand to, to, to uh, uh, limit Palestinians, to congest Palestinians in their uh, slums, and take more land, allocate more budgets for Jews. And we already see the outcome. Uh, we already see the outcome in two rulings of an Israeli, of a Jerusalemite judge. He ruled, it's one person called Moshe Drori, he's known to be right-winger. Um, he had two dangerous rulings uh, in, uh, immediately after the law was accepted. <coughs> was, in, was endorsed. According to one ruling um, that was uh, um, indemnities, it, a, a, a lawsuit uh, demanding indemnities for a Jewish uh, family whose um, a member was killed or was wounded, I think wounded, in, a, in an attack, in a suicide attack in, in Jerusalem in 1998. So the law, the 20 years before the law was, was endorsed, this suicide attack happened. Palestinian killed uh, several Jews and wounded some others in a suicide. Um, the lawsuit was filed 10 years after the attack. And then the law comes 20 years later on. Lawsuit against who? Lawsuit against the Hamas. It was lawsuit against, sorry, thank you, Hamas because the person who perpetuated, the, perpetrated this, uh, yeah, this attack was a member of Hamas. Uh, first it was, the lawsuit was against both Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, but then the judge only ruled about Hamas, but Hamas wasn't even there represented. It was not, it was just a, a, a court session without, without a defendant. Uh, and he specifies that according to the new law, the nation state law, according to the new law, uh, there is a special, special demand on the state of Israel to compensate, to make sure that the, this person is being compensated because the obligation of the state of Israel is to safeguard and to protect the Jews wherever they are. And they fail to protect, so there, is, there has to be a compensation. So he is relying on this law. It doesn't matter that there is no, no entity now to give, the, to, 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 to pay the money. Uh, but his uh, ruling is important. And then he ruled in another case of two women, uh, Jewish American, 
who were in a, on a boat uh, that was hijacked or uh, by by Palestinian militants in 1985, Achille Lauro. And uh, they were taken as hostages, they are alive, and they decided also to press charges against, uh, now I forgot against whom, I didn't say, anyway to press charges. And again, this, this the very same judge rules that it is the right of any Jew in the world to press charges against uh, so-called a terrorist organization because according to the law, Israel represents and has to protect the entire Jewish people, not only the Israeli Jews in Israel. So Israel is responsible for the, Israel is responsible for all the Jews in the world and that's why every Jew in the world has the right to press charges in Israel in Israeli courts. So here we already see the dangerous development. Um, what it also does, this law, because it is law, a law, it has an educa educational or pedagogical uh, um, consequence. It is a message to young people that Inequality is lawful, that inequality is uh, legal, that inequality is something that we see as a value of the state. It doesn't matter that, I mean, it is true, again, that de facto, according to many polls, uh, and also once we, you live in the society, you see it, the um, Number of Israeli youngsters who for, and not only youngsters, but it is growing more and more with the younger generation, who for example find that they, I mean, say openly that they don't want to live next to an Arab, or that Arabs are uh, inferior, or that they, want, that they think that Arabs should not have the equal rights in voting, the number of such uh, youngsters in polls is growing all, every, every year or two years when there are such polls, uh, and when we are not embarrassed to publish them, you see, this, uh, you see this increase. So now instead of fighting against it, or of explaining, or of going to schools and saying that this is wrong, no, you have the backing of the, of the Israeli parliament. The Jews are superior. The Jews are a uh, uh, better, better race than, uh, than the Palestinians. Um, now, the law should not, this law should not be taken se separate from a series of, uh, or from a, very concerted and, and uh, 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 conscious struggle of the, of the outgoing uh, parliament, Israeli parliament, with, uh, some, with the leading uh, members of parliament and ministers to weaken the Israeli judiciary, judiciary system, especially the Israeli high court. Now, I think that in the West, in the United States, and among uh, the Jewish community in the United States, the Israeli High Court has received uh, unjustly a very good reputation of fighting for equality and for rights. Now, this is an unjustified reputation uh, because uh, Israeli High Court, especially when it comes to Palestinians and to the occupation and to the settlements uh, in the West Bank and Gaza, and to Israeli military actions against the Palestinians, Israeli High Court never took a position against the establishment, never. It was maybe some uh, 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 individual cases that they took a different position, but not uh, not uh, in a systemic way that challenged Israeli occupation, challenged the settlement, challenged the, the, the uh, policies uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. And yet, sometimes it was, you know, like, a, okay, you have 
um, still people hope to get something because uh, I'll give you an example of something that after many years of a struggle did penetrate and did make create a change. Uh, Palestinians in Jerusalem have a different status than Palestinians in Israel, which, who are citizens, and Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza who are subjects, uh, with, who are called permanent residents. Palestinians in the West, in, in Jerusalem, um, can be citizens if they want, but most of them do not want. And most of them are permanent residents, but of Israel. So they have Israeli IDs. They cannot vote to the Israeli parliament, but they can vote to the municipality. And they have social rights as Jerusalemites, as Israelis, at least on paper. And they have freedom of movement that uh, Palestinians in the, in the 67 occupied territory, the rest of the 67 occupied territory do not have uh, this freedom of movement. Now, in 96, Israel started the policy of, uh, or enhanced the policy to revoke the status of Jerusalem residency of, of people in Jerusalem, of Palestinians in Jerusalem by many tricks. And Israel, this is part of Israel's demographic uh, manipulation or part of Israel's attempts to keep reducing the number of Palestinians either in Jerusalem or in, uh, or in the West Bank or in Israel proper. Uh, bureaucratic means, not, not other means, bureaucratic. So what Israel declared is that Palestinians and it started, the, the, the basis for this is actually a ruling of high court, but again, this is very specific. It's, it applies on Palestinians in Jerusalem the regulations of permanent residents. Now, permanent residents as opposed to citizen. And somebody who is a newcomer, somebody who came from outside, and decided to move and live in Israel. But this someone is not Jewish. Because if you are Jewish, you can become immediately a citizen. If you are not Jewish, you become a, a resident. But then if you are a resident, for example, you stay five, six years, and then you want to go away. And if you stay many years outside of Israel, then you lose your residency rights. <coughs> I think it's similar, it's like here, if you go, you have green card, you come from outside, you have green card, but then you go back, you lose your green card. Okay, that's, states do such things. So it's not, this is not the, the, the awful thing. What's awful is that you apply it on Palestinians who were born in Jerusalem, whose family was, uh, was in Jerusalem from, for 500, 600, 200 years, I don't know, who has uh, houses in Jerusalem, property in Jerusalem. And you say, no, you are a resident. If you go and live abroad, you lose your uh, residency status. Uh, and Israel did it to quite a few people over the years. And this policy even, incre even uh, 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 became more severe after 95. And this is during the peace process, so-called peace process, that even Jerusalemites, the Jerusalemites who lived who couldn't find housing in Jerusalem proper uh, because of Israeli policies that deprived, that took land from Palestinians and subsidized housing only for Jews and not for Palestinians. So those Palestinians who did not find housing or could not afford housing went a few, maybe a kilometer or two outside of Jerusalem to where is the West, so considered West Bank. And it was two minutes drive or two minutes walk, but in an area designed as the West Bank. So even those people were in a threat to, to lose their status of residents and actually become stateless um, with the pretext that their center of life is not in Jerusalem. And then there was a struggle. Then there was a struggle of Palestinians Israeli uh, human rights organizations and activists, press, 
and many lawyers, and many petitions were filed to high court, until last year, finally, finally, there was a high court ruling where one of the judges said, yeah, agreed to, to restore the residency status of a certain person, and this judge ruled and said, we cannot apply on them the same residency regulations as we apply to somebody who came from outside. After all, they are native Jerusalemites. This is really revolutionary. So the role of the high court, even though it has failed for so many years, still gave us some hope that, OK, with the struggle and struggle and struggle of uh, dedicated people and, 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 and the, the, the stamina of Palestinians, some, some such miracle does happen. So that is why the right wing has been acting for all those years, and in the last parliament, in the, la in the last five, four years of tenure of par la uh, parliament, the last parliament, Knesset, um, even more so, to, com to marginalize and to intimidate the judges. I don't have any other word than to intimidate. To intimidate that, the, that if they go and do take some brave rulings, isolated brave rulings when it comes to Palestinians, then they are. It's not democratic because it's not according to the uh, wish, will of the majority of the Israeli population. Imagine, yes. Um, so there is a, a, a bill now that is waiting to be, that is waiting to be uh, 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 voted in the Knesset um, about the ruling, uh, I think overruling, overruling paragraph that high court may revoke a law endorsed in the Knesset, uh, oh no, sorry, that the Knesset can revoke a ruling of high court uh, at, with a certain majority. That after all, and they say this is, this is democracy. The Knesset represents the, 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 the will of the people. So it is a complete distortion of the concepts of democracy, uh, not only as representing the will of the majority, but as the system that protects all all groups in the society. There are, in the last 10 years, or between 19, uh, 19, uh, 2015 to, to, 2000, uh, to now, uh, the Knesset, the parliament, Israeli parliament, had 60 bills that uh, actually advocate partial or full annexation of the West Bank, which would mean um, not only the de facto, but the Yuri apartheid system. Because this uh, annexation does not entail, does not entail equal rights to the Palestinians uh, in those territory, in the West Bank, and making them into citizens, but keeping them as uh, seventh grade or eighth grade uh, citizens. Out of these 60 bills, eight were uh, already endorsed as laws. And one of them, which is, uh, two of them are, are very especially dangerous. One is the, expropri we call it the expropriation law, that actually, and they call it the arrangement law, which actually, um, you can say black, uh, um, whitewash, uh, land grab of Palestinians or the use of Palestinian private land uh, for Israeli outposts, whitewashes this and legalizes this by law. That if they are, because according to an old ruling of high court, this is illegal to have an Israeli uh, settlement in a, on a private land. So there are quite a few such places that are in a limbo because legally they are not recognized as legal. But now this law comes and legalizes them. 
And these are about some, so the precedent here is very important. And the second law is um, that forces Palestinians who have issues with the state to go, instead of going to high court, to go to the district court. And uh, this is sort of annexation. This saying like if you have an issue with the state, it's like a citizen who has an issue with the state and goes to high court. Only later on you can go to, 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 to you, you go to district court. Only later you might go to uh, high court. Um, and we already see the results because when we go to high court, to, to, to district court, the judges there are even worse than the judges, judges in high court. More intimidated or more, dis more disregarding international law and values uh, than high court. High court still there is a, uh, there used to be a, a relative high standard of, of knowledge of law. But, uh, or international law, knowledge. I don't say adoption, but knowledge. In district court, there is uh, more and more disregard. I'll finish by telling that uh, this, uh, that there are around seven petitions already filed against the law, petitions to high court. There are some petitions by Druze members, uh, Druze citizens. The Druze are, see themselves as, uh, as Israelis, many Druze, not all, but uh, Druze, it's a certain Islamic, certain group of Islamic denomination that uh, serves in the army and uh, unlike other Arabs, and they, uh, they were very hurt by the, the law because they say that you force us to, to, uh, to abandon our Israeliness because we are not Jewish. So there are some such petitions, not one. There are petitions of other Palestinian citizens of the State of Israel. Uh, there is a, new, a petition by the Israeli Association for Civil Rights and a very interesting petition uh, by, by around 30, I think, uh, Jews who are of originally from Arab and Muslim states. And they say this law also disregards our culture and our legacy, Arab legacy. And we feel part of this region, of the, of the Arab uh, uh, region, and by disconnecting and, and eliminating the uh, importance of Arabic and Arabic culture, you actually tell us that we do not, that, uh, that you, you, uh, you disrespect our roots in the Arab uh, uh, culture and tradition. And now I read another, it's a bit of a gimmick, but it's a very good gimmick, another petition by not the, the not the Mizrahi petition, or not the Arab Jewish petition, but an Ashkenazi petition, meaning the Jews of, of uh, European origin, a petition against the law saying this law makes us, Ashkenazi Jews, superior to everybody, and we object to being superior. <laughs> so. <laughs> Okay, so I know I told you it was specific, but I hope uh, uh, I managed to describe and to uh, answer to your request to, this, to explain about the nation state law. Thank you. All right, can you, is this on? No. No. Speak up, Pat. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Now it's on. Okay. Um, we are going to take questions, and as, as you may or may not have noticed, um, we are being recorded, so I would ask that you wait until I can get there with the microphone before you start your, your question, and I don't move as fast as I used to. So, <laughs> so 
I suggest we think we take three questions and I or three or four and I answer. Okay. Yeah. I'm Maria Philippone. I came here from Des Moines tonight to hear you. It's a an, an honor to hear you speak. I travel to Gaza as often as possible with a medical delegation. I'm a physician and yoga instructor. Um, and I I want to just reference the article you wrote about Zugbi Zugbi. Yeah. I know them personally, a family in Bethlehem. Um, Elaine is an American citizen and uh, married a Palestinian, and she was recently denied um, entry back into Israel for a, an Palestine, upcoming wedding. Yeah. So, Palestine, yes. Um, I want to thank you so much. And my last trip to Gaza was in um, October. I'm wondering when you're, when you were last in Gaza and um, if you would ever have the opportunity to go back, how would you do so? Would mm -hmm. you come with us? <laughs> I think that uh, at first they denied you entry, right? Are you in the group that was denied entry? Oh, we've been denied. We've been I wrote denied about entry. You. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Gisha, the exactly. organization Gisha got us in um, yes. last October. So I wrote about it. I remember. And then yes. there are two Jewish doctors who were not allowed in. Right. Right. Uh, one Jewish doctor was allowed in, and I just oh. want to dispel one myth right here, right now. Um, every trip I've gone to Gaza on, there have been. A, a, at least one Jewish um, professional with us. One woman, Devorah, even wore her Star of David earrings nearly every day in Gaza, and she was welcomed just as warmly as the rest of us were. It's to, to Palestinians, it's not about religion, it's about occupation. Yeah, Jeffrey Weiss, also from Des Moines. Um, huge honor to um, meet you. When I heard I was going to get a chance to meet Amira Haas, I was. Wow. <laughs> um, Robert Fisk spoke of how you talked about the job of journalists is to, is to monitor the halls of power. And I always remember that. I use that in the classroom. And I just wanted to ask you about freedom of the press and freedom of speech um, in Israel in the wake of um, these kind of laws, and especially even your situation and some of the things that you have endured, um, especially in recent years. You want to take one more? Yeah. You have described, and those of us who followed the process for the last 50 years have observed the same thing. Israel is in a descent into fascism, and that's obvious to everyone who's watched the process if they're not already ideologically involved. Do you see anything short of the collapse of American support that can, re that can slow that process or reverse it? Okay. I'll start with the light questions. There were also <laughs> Gaza. <laughs> Actually, it's not so, it's not so uh, light because this is very painful because we are not allowed to enter Gaza. Israel started, Israel since the end of two, 2006 uh, bans Israeli journalists from entering Gaza. Uh, between 94 to, 90, to 2006, only journalists were allowed to enter and other Israeli citizens were not allowed unless they get special permit. Uh, and then to, since 2006, it had momentarily, it had some reasons for it because there were, it was a time of uh, internal disarray between Fatah, uh, between the PA and Hamas. And there were many kidnappings, by the way, never by Hamas uh, or of, of journalists. And, uh, you know, there was a kind of, of, of uh, uh, security, reasonable excuse, though, you know, uh, uh, journalists take many risks, so why not uh, the risk of entering Gaza? And um, that looked like severe, because with the time and then with the split between Hamas and uh, Fatah in, in, and PA in 2007, and the short civil war, it looked even further away, the ability to, of journalists to enter Gaza, Israeli journalists. Uh, in 2008, before the first war, there was, there was a free Gaza boat uh, uh, going sailing to Gaza several times. 
that was allowed in, surprisingly. So there were several delegations which went on boats and which were not intercepted. And I joined the third boat. And it was October 2008. I joined the, and it was like a miracle. I mean, I, I don't, it was one of my happiest days when I, we landed in Gaza. And, uh, and I meant to stay five, uh, three months at least. I came with, uh, ready to be three months in Gaza at least. And then uh, when the delegation, when the boat left and I remained, I told the Hamas authorities that I'm staying. And they put surveillance on me for 24-7 supposedly to protect me, uh, but I had my doubts. And um, it was very difficult to exercise my job as a journalist when there is all the time a huge car uh, that is known to be the car of, Palest of the Hamas uh, security following me everywhere. Everybody knew where I was because of this car. So I would get phone calls, ah, I, I saw you, you know, they didn't see me, they saw the car. But, uh, Okay, I learned, you know, I decided to take it as an anthropological uh, exper experience. <laughs> and uh, I told them once, the security of Hamas, I told them, but it costs a lot of money, you know, like I'm, I want to stay three months here. It costs you a lot of money. At that time, there was a very harsh blockade, Israeli blockade. There was only very limited hours of electricity. Uh, it was quite difficult. And they said, uh, inshallah, you stay one year, but it's okay, it's for your protection, uh, my foot. Um, and then my friends from Popular Front said, ah, don't worry, they get money from the Iranians. So don't worry about money. I mean, that was the Gazan joking. Um, but after three weeks, they got tired of me and they ordered me out. <laughs> and I'm still angry because a month later, the war the first bloody war broke out. I mean, blood, everything, but the big war of 2008-9 uh, started, and I could have been there. I mean, as myself, probably I should thank them for that I wasn't there as, as, as Amira, that I didn't see it with my own eyes. But of course, as a journalist and also as a friend of, my fr of so many people in Gaza, I was very angry not to not to have been there during the war. Um, and one day after the army pulled out of Gaza, I entered again. And this time they didn't put any surveillance on me, which is only a proof that from the start it was just a pretext, the security. And I said five months in Gaza. Um, I managed to enter through Rafah. And then a third time for a short, short days, but the Egyptians did not allow us uh, to remain longer, we came through Rafah. Um, and indeed, I know that the 10 years that have passed made our, uh, created the, I mean, the enormous, the change is enormous. I cannot even imagine. Uh, it was bad then, it was bad 25 years ago when I lived there. I remember when I lived in Gaza between, between 93 to 97, <clears throat> and the Israeli policy of restrictions of freedom of movement was in full force, people, people attribute the, the blockade only to the, uh, to the rise as a measure as a, against Hamas, but this is not true. It started in 91, the severe restrictions on movement. So I was, while living there, and there were, uh, I was asked, now it's not a secret anymore, uh, I was, I got a phone call by the Israeli head of the intelligence back then, Ami Ayalon, who wanted to talk to me. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, uh, I, I, of course it was quite baffling, but I, I, I'm not used to, I'm, I'm not the kind of journalist that gets phone calls from, from the military, the heads of the military. I said, okay, on condition that I consult with my friends and also my friends know if I meet you, certain friends in Gaza, which, uh, which I did. And then some kind of curiosity, I decided to go. I must say that my father was very much against it because he says, you never talk to them. But it was okay. And then he asked me, 
uh, how I feel in Gaza. And I told him, if I live in Gaza, if I stay in Gaza 10 days, consecutive days, and I have the right to go out and back. But if I have the, the, the if I'm staying so long, I want to explode because it's so difficult. Because there is, so this is back in 95. So imagine how it is now. Uh, feeling of, of suffocating, of living in prison, of no horizon. Um, so that's why I depend on delegations like yours and, and, and people to try and, 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 and get more information. But it's, I, I know that there is always a limit to how much we can imagine how terrible it is uh, now in Gaza. Freedom of, pre of the press. Look, we have freedom of the press. Uh, there is no real official censorship that does not allow us to publish the news that I publish. That are always following this uh, principle of uh, monitoring centers of power. But we have something maybe worse than official, pre uh, official censorship, and this is social censorship. Uh, or the, the fact that the readers do not want to know, do not want to read. And now it is even more, it is even easier to see how much they don't want to read it because on the internet and you have the clicks and they count everything. So my editors know that my, my articles get only so very few readers in Israel than uh, then my, you know, maybe one day they, 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 they will employ, the websites will have to employ journalists according to the number of clicks, who knows. So um, there is a message of the Israeli society that they, are not, they do not want to know. Uh, or that they do not care. But as freedom, I mean, as the right to, vote, to, to write, the opportunity to write, and if not in Israel, outside, and to come here to speak, and to speak uh, to foreign media, still there is a, a enough democracy that allow us to do this. But there are many other than Haaretz, all the other media, that maybe 25 or 30 years ago did have news about expropriation of land or of killing of innocent people, killing of civilians, did have more news about it. Now, hardly anything. So again, it is the society and not, not from above, but from below. Uh, now, what will stop the process of uh, fascization? Yeah, we see it uh, galloping, you know. We see, we hear rabbis that, that uh, come out with, uh, with such bizarre, bizarre is not the right word, but such uh, 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 statements racist and, and, and uh, uh, racist statements completely with disregard to Jewish history. Somebody even, I didn't even write in full, I was here, but somebody even endorsed, I mean, re uh, commented positively on Hitler, one of those uh, rabbis, rabbis in, 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 uh, who, who are responsible for the education of uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, soldiers, too. Um, I think, I guess that it's important to uh, appeal to Jewish communities uh, that I feel that still, you know, in, peop in places like here, maybe England, that still you can appeal to their if not uh, values of equality, at least to their sense, historical sense, an understanding of history. Uh, for them to understand that the Israel that they took as a, as a model or thought it was a model is far away from it, on the contrary. That it endangers not only 
the people in the country, be it Palestinians and Jews, but it also endangers uh, endangers the, the diaspora, endangers uh, in these processes. Uh, Jews that are appalled by the fact that our prime minister is best friends with anti-Semites in this in Europe, uh, Viktor Orban of Hungary. Uh, now we know that the the the, the, the campaign campaign, the anti-Semitic campaign against Soros, uh, the philanthropist, the milliardaire philanthropist who uh, 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 financed many NGOs in, uh, outside and inside Hungary. So this campaign against him was initiated from people from the entourage of Netanyahu. And Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu did not condemn it. Um, so short of America stopping, uh, supporting us, and I don't see this happening, especially with your- you America or America? Ameri no, America. You said a miracle or America? America. United States that right now, uh, uh, I don't have to tell you with your present uh, administration, uh, that only supports Israel more and more so, then perhaps the, 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 the effort should be directed at, at Jewish uh, communities. Um, but also at, th that is why the call for BDS is important. It is an important tool uh, because also Israeli, mostly Israeli business uh, community. Uh, we know that R is and was uh, alarmed by the BDS call because it affects their interests. We also know that the very idea of Oslo, uh, the Oslo process, started also or was very warmly supported by the business community in the early 90s because they felt that in a, in a globalized world, we need to open, they need, they are in, in need of, open, of opening markets and of improving relationships that were not uh, trade relationships with Europe, for example, and others that were not, did not get uh, um, many incentives because of the occupation. So they were behind uh, uh, Rabin and labor in pushing for some kind of, a, for this kind of peace, peace agreement with Palestinians and with the Arab world. And indeed, the Oslo process opened markets for Israel that had been not uh, there before. And they remained open in spite of the fact that Oslo was exposed not as a peace process, but as a, as a further colonization process. So concentrating and reminding uh, companies in the world that the settlement and building in the settlements and building in the occupied territory is against international law. And therefore, uh, there are communities and municipalities and uh, private people and uh, universities do not want to do anything with such companies that invest in the occupation, and I mean 67 uh, occupation, this, this might be a message to Israeli business class, business community. But it has to be much more than uh, um, there is now. I want, as a, I want as a citizen of Israel, as a Jew, to believe that we can stop it. Uh, and that we can prevent one of the uh, most dangerous and probable uh, consequences of this fascization, and this is the expulsion, mass expulsion, another mass expulsion of Palestinians. Because this Israeli right wing, you know, they don't, they don't, uh, um, work so hard in order to, to uh, minimize democracy. They don't do it because they are against democracy, but because they know that this democracy or these democratic principles 
are indeed protecting the Palestinians and they are, or have a potential to protect Palestinians from, from losing all their rights in the country. But once all those uh, walls, democratic walls are falling down, it'll be easier to, yeah, to uh, materialize plans or, or even dreams of the right wing to see Palestinians completely disappear again. And this is a, a major danger. I still say it is preventable, but we have to face it, to face the danger and to see that this is an, Israel, the, an, an aim of a, a political power, political force in Israel, which is the reli uh, religious Zionist uh, right-wing forces that become stronger and stronger in Israeli politics. Who's next? Oh, I saw three hands go up. Could you talk a little bit about the resistance within Israel to these policies that you've been describing? We're going to take three. Who was mm -hmm. Uh, there, <clears throat> there's so many things that one wants to ask, and there's so little time. Uh, uh, two things, if I may. Uh, one is, why should Jews in the U.S. care about Judaism in Israel? Uh, why should Jews in the U.S. care about Judaism in Israel? Uh, and I, I ask that in the sense of Newman started his, when he introduced you, said he and you, an Arab and an Israeli, had a convivial time having dinner or something. Why should it be surprising that you didn't have a, that, that you wouldn't have a convivial time. In other words, what is it that draws Jews to Israel that can be debased by the way what's going on in Israel now? And, and, and a related question is, can you compare and contrast religion in Israel to religion in the occupied territories? You mentioned the, that the law you discussed uh, does, not, uh, does not mention demo democracy and does not mention inequality. Does it mention citizenship? And how does it define and treat citizenship? I have to look, yeah. Okay. Um, the Israeli the question about resistance to these policies in Israel. There are groups, uh, of course, the main resistance comes from Palestinian citizens of Israel. Uh, they resist Israeli policies uh, by, uh, in parliamentarian ways, demonstrations, uh, legal acts, uh, uh, educational uh, sessions, so they, they are, this is the main force that resists uh, and endangers itself and risks itself um, much more because they have, they are less uh, protected by democratic, remaining democratic uh, laws than, than Jews, but still they do it. Um, and by living and by, by uh, finding ways and finding, uh, you know, there are no, no land left for them in, 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 in their own uh, hometowns, in the villages. Then they go and live elsewhere. And there they fight for, for the state to accept them as equal citizens. And it is not easy. For example, uh, Nazareth, the city of uh, Nazareth, but upper Nazareth, which is built on land taken from Palestinian villages uh, for the sake of uh, Jewish, uh, uh, mostly newcomers. And now 20% of this city are uh, Palestinians. And sometimes they live on, they bought, they had to buy a flat 
in the, on the land that belonged to their father or grandfather and that was taken from their family. And this, the city that refuses to have, for example, mosques or churches or schools for Palestinians there, special, I mean, schools that will be in Arabic for the Palestinian students and pupils. So they are fighting. They are fighting from, with the help of Israeli, uh, Israeli uh, human rights organizations uh, that are both comprised of Palestinian and Jewish uh, lawyers and experts. So there are, there are demonstrations, there are, this is the main, so the main camp are the Palestinians. And the Jews are, um, the Jews are uh, engaged also in several, uh, in two main parties which are opposition to the policies. One party is a Zionist party called Meretz, and the other party is the, uh, Democratic Front for Peace and Equality, and this is together with the Communist Party, and the majority are Palestinians, but Palestinian citizens of Israel, and uh, uh, Jewish activists. So this is again by these forms. We are few, we are, we are very, very few. We are fewer than we used to be uh, 20, 30 years ago, because with the years, um, the benefits that Israeli Jews are getting from the reality, from this reality of occupation, uh, the benefits have become very substantial in people's life. And you have young generations who don't know that this is wrong, who uh, got accustomed and uh, who's, who see that this is working. I mean, until 30 years ago, people knew that peace is incompatible with settlements. Now we see that we have good life with settlements. And the world accepts us, so who cares about the Palestinians? Um, and people are, uh, if people are not afraid of losing something, that they do not fight against injustice. So the, those who fight are very few, but the, the quality, I would say, the quality of the resistance has, has improved or has, there is a change, uh, 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 there is a qualitative change in the, there are more, uh, it's less just, you know, vague demonstrations once a year or twice a year or like this. It's more activities that, 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 that create contacts, direct contacts with Palestinians and uh, with, um, uh, the struggle and the effort to save to save the land that Israel wants to expropriate for Palestinians, but um, but I see you know like I look at a young uh, there is a, a there is an, uh, an, a website called 972 in English, and uh, you know some of you know it and it also has an equivalent in Hebrew. It is a collective of both Jews and, Pal and Jews and Palestinians who write there. And they are all active in other forms. It was, it is, uh, it was established or it, it is run by, by uh, a guy who 15 years ago was served two years in, the, in a prison uh, because he refused military service. Uh, the reason attempt to to reach more such refuseniks or to convince more such youngsters to refuse the military uh, service altogether. It's very little. <laughs> it's uh, uh, and disappointing. But we should not blame those who are few. We should blame those who are. And you know, one of the things that and I'm, I'm asked here, and people say, oh, this, it needs courage to speak out against Israeli policies, and I say, not really. Uh, because, especially us, Israeli Jews, we do not, uh, we are not really in danger. Maybe we will be, you know, like, but it's nothing to compare with dissidents in, Soviet Union, in the Soviet Union, or uh, white people who joined ANC in the South Africa. Uh, or people who fight in Mexico and Guatemala against the drug cartels. We don't risk our life, our liberty. I don't risk my uh, salary. You know, I can come freely. 
Also those people who refused service in the army, okay, there was two years in jail, so what? It's not, uh, you know, they can go one, they, they, they go and they complete their studies and they get do good jobs. Their parents are not persecuted. So right now we are not being persecuted for being in opposition. And that is why I think the responsibility and the blame and the guilt that one day would be uh, uh, rightly uh, associated with the majority that or, or those people who know that there is something wrong here but didn't do anything, who stood by, their responsibility is much heavier than in any, any other country in the world that has been through repression. Because we don't risk anything now. And if there were more people doing this, they could have done less against us. Now they feel free hand. Um, now why should Jews care about Israel and about Judaism in Israel? First of all, because many do. So it's without answering why, they do. So if they anyway do, and many Jews do see, do see connection to Israel, emotional, some family, historical, uh, sentimental, um, then we should draw their attention to the fact that Israel is not the model, model state that they thought or they portray Israel as such. And the answer why Jews have a should have a connection, I, I, I don't say they shouldn't. Let, let me say they shouldn't have. Um, and perhaps when we see in, in, in different countries that younger Jews more and more dissociate themselves from Israel because they realize uh, what its true character, what its true character is, then uh, yeah, it is alarming. I know it is alarming to many, to the older generation. And maybe this is one of the ways to, uh, um, To answer your question, that it will affect somebody in Israel, that there will be that there are some people who will be alarmed, or some groups and some social factors who will be alarmed by this fact that young younger generations dissociate themselves. Again, it is not enough. Again, you have growing Orthodox communities that, on the contrary, have uh, do have more attachment to Israel today than they used to have, uh, than their forefathers had uh, 40 or 50, uh, 60 years ago. There is a connection because of history. There is a connection because still, still for, still by change, but the, the, the uh, presence of the years of the Third Reich, I usually refrain from saying the Holocaust, though it saves words, but I'm, I don't like the term Holocaust. So the years of the Third Reich, when, when Europe and the West actually um, conveyed the, a very clear message to the Jews who lived in the diaspora and saw the diaspora as their home, they conveyed the message that you are not wanted neither in Germany, nor in Europe, nor in America, nor in South America, uh, and not in the world at all, this still is very strong. Uh, for, for many Jews, the, 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 the memory of the destruction of the temple is strong. So we are talking now about something that didn't happen uh, 2,000 years ago, but uh, 70 years ago, and there are still people who are who are survivors and children of survivors of this time. And for me, I, I will tell you personally, it is still, I mean, I do live this message of Europe. I, believe me that I would have been, I would have preferred to, to be born in, in Europe, where my parents uh, were born. 
either in Romania or Yugoslavia, or if they emigrated to France. Uh, I love French. I mean, uh, many more people speak it than Hebrew. Um, but, we, but the message was very clear that you are not wanted. My parents, when they returned from the, from the concentration camp and the ghetto, they wanted to remain in their respective countries, but then they discovered that the societies did not accept them. So not only their uh, fate as Jews was different from the fate of other uh, citizens of those countries, but they were not even welcome, and both of them were generations in those countries. So this, this made Israel into, this made Zionism and the Zionist idea of a Jewish state attractive to Jews much more than it was before the Third Reich, before the advent of Hitler. And this has not gone. I mean, uh, this, is, this exists. The thing is how we make this also into a responsibility. Because at any moment, any Jewish, any Jew per, Jewish person in this audience, right now you have more rights in Israel uh, than any Palestinian. And also Palestinian citizens and Palestinians who were born there and cannot return. Or uh, you have more rights. You can live anywhere you want. You'll have social rights. You can get to work immediately. You can get benefits as Jews and retain your, Jew your American passport. So this also makes you part, willy-nilly, it makes you part of the, of the Israeli project. So if you know it is unjust, you are compelled to, be, to, to, to care about what is happening there. You are compelled because you, are, you become complicit in something you didn't choose to be complicit of, but you become complicit of it, you and your children. So here is... Uh, um, religion in Israel and the West Bank. You know, both societies um, actually rely on, on, a, on religious law. Uh, I remember in, uh, so, and independent of each other. Palestinians uh, cannot marry, I mean, marry in religious marriage, and so are Jews. Um, you cannot marry in civilian. I mean, you, you are, I mean, what's, what, heavy, what is having, uh, uh, you can marry outside of the country in civilian and then be recognized. But inside uh, Israel and Palestinian territory, you need to go to a, you need to go to a religious to have religious marriage, so it means you can marry your own uh, your own. Uh, it's tricky. I mean, you the Jews cannot marry somebody who is not Jewish. They can marry outside, but not. And uh, Palestinians, men can marry a Christian or Jewish woman. It doesn't matter according to Islam, but not vice versa. Uh, at the beginning of 2000, I met a guy, he, is a, he was a militant of uh, El Qassam, uh, brigades in, in Gaza. I wanted to speak to someone who, is, who will talk to me more than slogans. Because usually the youngsters, you know, they speak slogans and I don't like to, to, it was for my, to write an article or to, more than an article. And a very, very, uh, uh, really very uh, uh, thoughtful person I don't remember what he studied. He was killed in one of the attacks when he went to fight against Israeli tanks, who, which invaded Gaza. But we were talking about the future. And he said, oh, we can be one state. And then uh, Hamas and Shas, you know Shas, the, the, the religious Mizrahi party, could have a coalition. And the Popular Front, uh, Palestinian Popular Front, and Israeli Communist Party will have, an, uh, will have another coalition. <laughs> so he, he related to the, to the affinity, religious affinity between two main parties and popular parties. Uh, 
that's also, you know, and I know that people are, are, are uh, you know, advocating one state solution and uh, we have to remember that the two, two societies are very, I mean, see religion as very important. And uh, more and more, and, and cannot, cannot conceive of the place as, uh, as not based on religious law, be it Jewish religious law or Palestinian or uh, Muslim uh, religious law. So this is a huge obstacle that we have to, to pass. If you, um, and both societies endorse it, do not, cannot conceive of our societies as based on secular laws. For Palestinians, I must tell you, one of the most difficult things that I, I, I confront is when Palestinians ask me, um, do you believe in God? And I've learned that it's very offensive to them, extremely offensive, when I tell the truth, that I do not. I can tell it to a Christian, but I cannot tell it to a Muslim, you know. Um, and, you know, I look for ways and I, I uh, if I have time, I can tell you a nice anecdote. I don't know, you allow me? Sure. Sure? Okay, I, I think that you're, uh, after the war of 2008-9, I went to collect testimonies of soldiers uh, who were there. And I went with a group, with an um, active of the, uh, activist of a group called Breaking the Silence. Uh, Real, I think that many of you know about them, the soldiers uh, or ex-soldiers who, who collect uh, testimonies of soldiers, of other soldiers during service and after service. And there is the founder of this organization, a, used to be religious Orthodox Jew, who served in uh, Hebron at the beginning of the 2000s. And as an Orthodox Jew, as a religious Jew, he saw that there is a clash here, a dissonance between the basic principles of Judaism, nothing to, nothing leftist, but just basic humanistic uh, values that he, he thought Judaism implied, and the reality of uh, 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 violent, violent, aggressive, aggressive, vicious uh, uh, group of religious Jews in Hebron that take over and actually uh, succeeded in ethnic cleansing, the center of Hebron, the, the old Hebron. So they started, that's how they started the group. And so we go together to talk with the soldiers. And after, and he looks like a settler, I mean, like he has a big kippah, he's big, he has a beard. Uh, so like, or a rabbi or something, like a caricature of a rabbi, a nice caricature of a rabbi. Young one, he's young, he's around 30 now, uh, 35. And then he was, uh, so we go, after each soldier, we go into a car and he falls down on the chair, on the seat of the car. I, I was driving, or, and he says, no doubt, our place in hell is guaranteed. <laughs> so, then I, in one of my um, failed attempts, there, there is a village, I write a lot about Israeli policies of colonization of the West Bank and of land grab in the West Bank. And there is one village uh, west of Jerusalem uh, where Israel tried, uh, it's called Nabi Samuel, that is, that is a very strategic, uh, strategic point uh, that Israel made thousands of, 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 has applied thousands of tricks in order to get the land and there are People who really resisted it, uh, but the, the place is, 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 is really falling apart because they are completely isolated. There was one woman, she passed away, one of the women, Rasmi, I think her name, who was very strong in, in resisting all attempts to take her land. She was offered money, she was, offered, she was threatened, all kinds of tricks to keep her away, and she resisted it. So it was Ramadan and I, she invited me, I w went there to, 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 to uh, get information and to speak to people and she invited me to the Ramadan, uh, the, 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 the meal that breaks the fast. And then she asked me, do you believe in God? <laughs> so, you know, like, <laughs> well, you know, she was around 75, you know, I don't want to offend and I don't want to lie. 
And I know that it's very important. So, so then I told her the story with uh, Yuda, the, the one about. So I told her, our place in hell is uh, guaranteed. She says, I understand. You don't believe in God, but you believe in hell. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're so happy to have you here. We're very grateful that you were able to make the trip. And I thank you, everyone, for coming to, to listen to her. I'm, we'll be hanging around for a little while, so feel free to talk to her. Can I take your picture with you first? Is that OK? <laughs> sure. Yeah. What, all of us? We're going to cut off the film.